Hello again. So this time, um, this is a continuation of the lesson we did on graphing just a few minutes ago, um, except instead of looking at just regular direct variation, now we're looking at direct square variation. Okay, so we're going to look at what does this graph look like, what happens with the rate of change, what is the impact of k in this problem, things like that. Okay, so um, just like before, I'm going to make up one of these functions here. I'm going to make up y equals 2x squared. That's direct square variation. And I'm going to make myself a little t-chart. Hopefully from the last problem you learned that I love 0, 0, so I'm going to plug 0 in for x. If I plug 0 in for x, 0 squared is 0, and then 0 times 2 is still 0. So this this graph is still going to contain the point zero, zero, and that actually doesn't change even if I change that number that's in there for k. Um, let's just throw in a 1. So if I throw in a 1, 1 squared is 1, and then 2 times 1 is 2. Let's throw in a 3. I know it's going to get too big, but 3 squared is 18. I'm sorry, 3 squared is 9, and 2 times 9 is 18. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. I'll throw in a negative 2, and negative 2 squared gives me positive 4, and then 2 times 4 is 8, and that's about all I have room for, so we'll see how that goes for us. Let me see if I can zoom this in some, so you can see what I'm doing. So if I go to graph this, I know it's going to contain the point 0, 0, okay? It's going to contain the point 1, comma 2. 3 comma 18 is not going to fit on my graph. I should have done a different point there. Um, negative 2 comma 8 will fit. That's right here. And actually, if I, let's see, I'm going to continue my table a little bit here. If I threw in a positive 2, I would still get 2 squared is 4 and 2 times 4 is 8. So 2 comma 8 is also a point on this graph. And so you're going to find that a lot with these graphs is that they're actually symmetric. If I threw in a negative 1, because negative 1 squared is the same thing as positive 1 squared. I'm pointing to all these things that aren't even on your screen, I apologize. Um, 1 squared and negative 1 squared both give you the same thing. They both just give you 1, and then 2 times 1 is 2. So negative 1 is going to match up with 2. And we get this symmetric little pattern of dots that if I were to connect them, they would end up looking like this. Okay. And that graph, if you don't already know, is called a parabola. Not a parabola. A parabola. Now, I zoomed this in big and left it big because I want to talk about rate of change here for a second. And let me see if I can find a different color here. Um, I think I have green. Okay. So, um, if I want to look at rate of change, let's say between this point and this point. Rate of change is always found, and I don't think we actually wrote down the formula for this before, but maybe we should. Um, Rate of change is always found by finding the difference in your y values over the difference in your x values. Now some of you might be going, wait a second, that's the formula for slope. It is the formula for slope because slope is really just rate of change. It's just specific to a linear function. Okay, But you can do rate of change like this for any function. So on this particular graph, here my y value is a 2. And here my y value is an 8. So that's a difference of 6. Okay. And then comparing my x values here, this is at negative 1 and this is at positive 2. So this would be a total distance of 3. 6 over 3 is 2. So between those two points shaded in, or circled in purple, my rate of change would be 2. Meaning that on average, between those two points, my y values are increasing by 2 for every one x value that I go up. Okay? And I know that doesn't seem to mean a lot right now, but watch this. Let's say now I pick a different set of points. Let's say I pick this one here and, oh, I don't know, this one here. 
and I do rate of change that way. Okay, on this one, my y value change overall is going from 0 up to 8, so that would be 8 over, and my x value change, if I go up my 8 here, would be backwards 2, so that's negative 2, and I get negative 4 as my rate of change. Now that's weird, because when we did this with linear functions, my rate of change was the same no matter which two points I picked. Okay? But with parabolas, and really with any other graph, because there's a curve to the graph, the rate of change is not constant. And that's the big thing I want you to walk away with, is that it's not the same anywhere else on the graph. It's only between those two points. Okay? That's the big difference between linear functions and quadratic functions, is that the rate of change is not the same. Okay, let's talk about that k value for a minute. So if I were to make my k value negative, it does have one very unique effect on the graph. Um, when k is positive, your parabola is going to point upward like this. But when k is negative, your parabola is going to point downward like this. Still contains the point zero, 0, Always, always, always contains the point zero, 0, But the positive and negative controls whether it points up or down. Technically, the k value tells you some other stuff. It tells you like how wide and skinny your parabola is. We're going to get much more in depth with that when we get into chapter 6. Okay, so let's talk about some properties. And for a lot of these, um, our properties are going to change based on whether our k value is positive or k value is negative. Um, domain, however, isn't one of those things. Domain is the same no matter what. And no matter whether you're facing upward or downward, these graphs do spread out and cover the entire x-axis. So my domain is still just all real numbers. My range, however, changes depending on whether I'm looking at this graph or this graph. When my k value is positive, my range my range would be, um, it's everything above zero, greater than or equal to zero, because my parabola points upwards. So my range would be all real numbers, greater than or equal to zero. But when my k value is negative, and my parabola points downward, my range is going to look a little different. My range would be all real numbers less than or equal to zero. Okay, because it's everywhere below zero. Okay, and again, I don't know that I would spend the time memorizing that or if I would just learn to visualize these two graphs separately. Uh, Y-intercept is the same whether you're facing up or facing down. It's still going to be at the origin. Okay, all of these graphs go through zero, zero. And then let's talk limits. So we're going to say when k is positive, we're going to say when k is negative, we're going to say when x approaches infinity, and when x approaches negative infinity for each one. Oops, that's just be x approaches infinity, x approaches negative infinity. Okay, so when k is positive, when I'm looking at this graph, if I were to walk out along the x-axis forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, my y values are going up and up and up and up and up forever. So that means that when x approaches infinity, y also approaches infinity. And on this one, when I go in the negative direction, when I walk backwards along the x-axis, my graph is still going up forever in the positive direction. So whether I'm going towards positive infinity or negative infinity, my graph is always going up towards positive infinity. And that is the absolute opposite here. On this one, it doesn't matter whether I'm going out to positive infinity or to negative infinity. My graph is headed down to negative infinity, no matter what. So when x approaches infinity, y approaches negative infinity. And when x approaches negative infinity, y approaches negative infinity. Again, no matter what. Okay, so that's about it for this video. That was all the properties I want to make sure we covered. I do have some examples still to do, so I'll do that in yet another video um, so that you can kind of wrap your head around these concepts sort of separately.
All right, stay tuned for number three.